Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and after A.P. Hill helped save Robert E. Lee's army from defeat at the Battle of Antietam, Hill had two important contests, one with Jackson over their continuing feud and the Battle of Fredericksburg. Once Hill and the Army of Northern Virginia made it back into Virginia, Hill resumed his feud with Jackson. Hill asked that a court of inquiry be supplied to investigate the charge of neglect of duty. Robert E. Lee was in a difficult situation. Jackson's authority had to be respected, but he needed one of his best fighting generals in Hill. He would write, His, Hill's attention, being now called to what appeared to be a neglect of duty by his commander, but which from an officer of his character could not be intentional, and I feel assured will never be repeated. I see no advantage to the service in further investigating this matter, nor could it, without detriment, be done at this time. Hill took Lee's comment as a judgment call by Lee that he had agreed with Jackson's charge, so he wrote to Lee, I deny the truth of every allegation made by Major General Jackson, and I am prepared to prove my denial by a number of honorable men. If General Jackson had accorded me the courtesy of asking an explanation of each instance of neglect of duty as it occurred, I think that even he would have been satisfied and the necessity avoided of keeping a black list against me. Jackson is the officer who abuses his authority to punish and then sustains his punishment by making loose charges against an officer who had done and is doing his utmost to make his troops efficient. Jackson was willing to drop the matter, but sent Lee the charges to begin a court of inquiry. Lee saw that the situation was now getting out of hand and called the two men to Jackson's headquarters. By talking with both men together, Lee was able to smooth over but not extinguish the quarrel. From then on, Jackson and Hill would keep their communication formal and seldom. Also after Antietam, Lee was reorganizing the army. He would divide his army into two corps, one headed by Longstreet and the other headed by Jackson. Within his letter describing his decision to President Davis, he mentioned that Hill was the third best officer that he had in the army, and if a third corps was to be created, Hill would receive command of it, demonstrating how much faith and trust he had in Hill. During the fall encampment in Northern Virginia, the army and Hill's light division recuperated. An infestation of lice and fleas forced Hill to order whole companies to march into the Opaquan River to hopefully drown the pest and bring relief to the soldiers. During this time, the division regrouped. It ended Antietam with 4,700 men, but by the end of October, the force was back up to 9,400 through men returning to the ranks from minor wounds and recruitment bringing in new troops to the ranks. With the feud with Jackson calmed, Hill settled into the quiet encampment with his children and wife by his side, the three girls he called them. His men presented him with a bronze-colored pipe, carved to make it appear that a small hand seemed to be gripping the bowl which he carried from that point on. On more than one occasion, when a rabbit or squirrel chase was in progress with his troops, Hill would dismount and give chase right along with them. Expeditions and engagements were infrequent during this time, but the Light Division did destroy parts of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and fought some light engagements at Castleman's Ferry and Snickers Gap. During this time, Hill wrote a telling letter to his friend Jeb Stewart, the commander of Lee's cavalry, about General Jackson. Hill wrote, I suppose I am to vegetate here all the winter under that crazy old Presbyterian fool. I am like the porcupine, all bristles, and all sticking out too, so I know we shall have a smash up before long. I don't like the complexion here. I think a fatal sin has been committed, provided the Yanks have the sense to take advantage of it, which they don't often do, for they sometimes won't take the peach when held to their lips. The Almighty will get tired helping Jackson after a while, and then he'll get the darndest thrashing. And the shoe pinches, for I should get my share and probably all the blame, for the people will never blame Stonewall for any disaster. When Abraham Lincoln replaced George McClellan with Ambrose Burnside, the new Union commander launched his own campaign to hopefully capture Richmond by crossing the Rappahannock River at Fredericksburg, but Lee shifted his army to that location, blocking Burnside's attempt, which was hindered by the slow movement of the pontoon bridge to the army. Jackson's corps formed on the Confederate right on Prospect Hill, overlooking the river and the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. As Hill was on his way to post his troops, 
he received word that Nettie had died of diphtheria. His grief may be the reason that the disposition of his brigades seemed unusual and dangerous for the Confederates. A gap emerged in the front line nearly 600 yards wide. Gregg's brigade sat above the gap, but the dense forest reduced the visibility to zero. Who was to blame for this? Many people. Jackson should have inspected his lines more thorough, as well as Hill. Both Lane and Archer had the responsibility of notifying his division commander of the gap. Archer claimed that he did notify his division commander, but nothing was done. Jeb Stewart rode near Hill's lines and saw the gap, but declared that the Federals could not get close enough to threaten the Confederate line. Ultimately, Hill should have been aware of the gap and fixed the situation. Some historians have suggested that Hill did not want to subject his troops to the cold swampy ground in that sector, so he did not assign them to that area, but this is speculation. Nevertheless, it would prove a dangerous mistake. As Union forces were forming in their front, Jackson and Hill met. Hill was in his usual attire, black felt hat, calico shirt, wool shell jacket, trousers stuffed into knee-high boots, saber and revolver strapped to his waist. Jackson looked unnatural in a new elaborate uniform, a recent gift from Stuart. When the fog lifted, the Union division of George Gordon Meade made their appearance on the field. Forty-seven cannons began firing from Hill's division, knocking holes in Meade's line, but on they marched. It became evident that the blue troops were headed straight for the exposed gap in Hill's line. The Pennsylvanians turned Archer's left flank and headed for Gregg's South Carolinians. In the confusion of having to restore order to his troops, Gregg was shot and tumbled from his horse, mortally wounded. Another Union division smashed into Hill's left and began pushing it back. As General Pender came riding down his line amid the ricocheting of bullets, his staff noticed his left arm hanging limp and blood dripping down his fingers. When his staff asked about his condition, he said, Oh, that is a trifle, no bones broken, and continued the examination of his line. Hill's reserve and the division of Jubal Early pushed back the stubborn Federals. Jackson's front had been restored and other divisions took Hill's place. The Lott division took heavy casualties, amounting to 231 killed, 1,474 wounded, and 417 missing. Two-thirds of Jackson's losses came from Hill's division. Hill visited the hospital and according to a chaplain, I remember seeing him visiting, as was his custom. Looking after the comfort of his wounded, and with his own hands lifting some of the poor fellows into more comfortable positions. Some historians have pointed to two factors that led to the gap in Hill's line. One, Hill was already not speaking to Jackson in any great length, which may have hidden the disposition of his troops from his corps commander. Two, he was grieved at the loss of his daughter and had become distraught, playing no active part in the engagement. Hill normally fought alongside his troops in the front lines, but this battle was different. He was hardly seen by his troops or brigade commanders. That led to a rumor that he had even been captured. Never had this happened in Hill's Civil War career. The only difference in this battle and others is the death of his child right before the battle transpired. After the battle, the Lot Division moved eight miles downriver to a location the men christened Camp Gregg after the slain general. It would be here that they would regroup and recuperate from the hard fighting of 1862 and prepare for the spring campaign of 1863.